Hello, my name is Dr. Carol Benson. I'm from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Today, my lecture will be to discuss anomalies of the fetal gastrointestinal and genitourinary tracts. The fetal abdomen is the part of the body below the diaphragm in the trunk of the body. The images that we typically take during an obstetrical ultrasound exam include the measurement of the abdominal diameter at the level of the stomach and intrahepatic portion of the umbilical vein. We take images of the kidneys, the urinary bladder, and we also take an image of the anterior abdominal wall at the umbilical cord insertion. On the abdominal measurement view, the first thing we do is assess the stomach to make sure that it's present. This is done in order to exclude such anomalies as esophageal atresia or diaphragmatic hernia. We look at the stomach location to make sure that it's in the proper location rather than having a situation such as situs inversus or situs ambiguous. We look at its size to exclude bowel obstruction and on the same view, we look for other fluid collections that are present that shouldn't be there, such as with duodenal obstruction or when there is another lower bowel obstruction. So this is a view of the fetal abdomen with the abdominal diameter measured. You can see that we have a transverse view of the abdomen. The abdomen is round, and we see the stomach in the left upper quadrant of the fetus and the intrahepatic portion of the umbilical vein. And the measurement is taken from skin surface to skin surface, anterior posteriorly, and transverse. If the stomach is not seen in the left upper quadrant, this may actually be a sign of a normal fetus who just has not swallowed recently. And if you follow this fetus for 10 or 15 minutes, you should see the, the fluid in the stomach later during the examination. But a persistent absence of the stomach may represent an anomaly, such as esophageal atresia or left diaphragmatic hernia, where the stomach is not in the abdomen, but rather in the chest, or a cleft lip, or some central nervous system anomalies where the fetus can't swallow, or with a situs abnormality, where the stomach is somewhere else in the abdomen besides the left upper quadrant. Absence of the stomach may also be seen when there's severe oligohydramnios and no fluid for the fetus to swallow. So here's a fetus scanned at 18 weeks gestation where during the entire exam, no fluid was seen in the upper abdomen, in the left upper quadrant or anywhere in the left upper abdomen. And here are two representative images. On her return at 21 weeks gestation, we learned the reason why there was failure of filling of the stomach. It was because the fetus had a bilateral cleft lip. You can see on this coronal view of the face, a cleft in the upper lip on each side with the central maxillary prominence. And here on the clip, you can see that large defect, which prevented the fetus from swallowing properly. This fetus has situs inversus, so instead of finding the stomach in the left upper quadrant, the stomach was found in the right upper quadrant. This fetus did have a complete situs inversus, so examination of the chest shows that the heart was also on the right instead of the left. When echogenic bowel is seen in the fetal abdomen during the second trimester, it may indicate an underlying abnormality. Echogenic bowel is associated with cystic fibrosis, intrauterine growth restriction, trisomies 21 and 18, and can also be seen in a fetus who's had, had some bleeding during the pregnancy, and the fetus then has swallowed the blood that has been tracked into the amniotic cavity. So here's a fetus at 18 weeks gestation with a clump of echogenic bowel. You can see it here on the coronal view of the fetus next to the iliac crest is a clump of bowel that is as bright as the bone. And on transverse view of the lower abdomen, we see this clump of echogenic bowel. This fetus proved to have trisomy 21. You can see in addition to the echogenic bowel, the fetus had the typical cardiac defect often seen with trisomy 21, an atrioventricular canal. You can see the defect in the ventricle, ventricular and atrial septums and the abnormal atrioventricular valves. 
This fetus also has echogenic bowel. You can see on this longitudinal view of the fetus, this clump of bowel that's echogenic, and on this transverse view, this loop of echogenic bowel. And this is present because the, there has been a bleed, there's a large subchorionic hematoma, some of the blood has tracked into the amniotic fluid that the fetus swallowed, causing the echogenic bowel. I've already mentioned a little bit about amniotic fluid and swallowing. Amniotic fluid is surrounds, surrounds the fetus and provides support for the fetus and allows the fetus to move and to grow. The level of amniotic, fe of amni amniotic fluid is dependent on a homeostatic balance between the amount of renal function, the amount of fluid that the fetus produces by urinating, and the amount of swallowing and gastrointestinal absorption. So here we can see this in a schematic format. The fetus does swallow the amniotic fluid, and then the fetus does replenish the amniotic fluid by urinating into the amniotic cavity. When there's diminished or absent swallowing, or if there's inadequate fluid resorption in the gastrointestinal tract, excess fluid will collect in the amniotic cavity, causing polyhydramnios. This is particularly common in cases where there's gastrointestinal obstruction. The higher the obstruction, the greater the degree of polyhydramnios. So when the obstruction is at the level of the esophagus or the stomach or duodenum, you'll have pretty severe polyhydramnios. But if it's more distal in the jejunum or ileum, we, you may have mild polyhydramnios. And with colonic obstruction, there be no, may be no polyhydramnios at all. So with esophageal atresia, you'll have severe polyhydramnios and an absent or very small stomach. Here's an example of that. Notice the large amount of amniotic fluid surrounding this fetus. Here's the fetal chest with the heart beating, and here's the fetal abdomen. We're scanning through the upper abdomen and we see no stomach here. Because of the esophageal atresia, the fetus was unable to swallow the fluid into the stomach. Here's a fetus who actually did have esophageal atresia, mild polyhydramnios, but this fetus also had a tracheoesophageal fistula. And for this reason, we saw fluid in the upper abdomen inside the stomach. But we also were able to see the upper esophagus. Here you can see on a view of the fetal neck, we have the trachea, which is fluid filled, and behind the trachea is a little bit of fluid in the upper portion of the esophagus. A little while later, this fluid extended down lower and expanded the upper part of the esophagus and eventually filled it here. Of course, this is as far as it will go because this is the site of the atresia. Gastric outlet obstruction is rare but not unheard of. It typically results from pyloric atresia, either as a primary anomaly or secondary to a vascular insult. The findings on ultrasound include polyhydramnios and a dilated stomach. So here's a fetus at 35 weeks gestation surrounded by mild polyhydramnios and the stomach was persistently dilated throughout the examinations of this fetus. This fetus proved to have pyloric atresia. You can see that after birth they've taken an x-ray of the baby. The stomach is filled with air but no air has passed from the stomach into the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. With duodenal atresia, there's obstruction of the duodenum either by atresia or by a web or an annular pancreas. The sonographic findings are characteristic. There's a double bubble of fluid in the upper abdomen. In addition, there will be polyhydramnios. Duodenal atresia is associated with other anomalies in more than 50% of cases, so if you do make this diagnosis, do look carefully at the rest of the fetus to try to identify other anomalies. Look at the vertebral body and the skeletal system. Look for other gastrointestinal anomalies. Look for cardiac anomalies, genitourinary anomalies. And in addition, the rate of trisomy 21 is quite high in these fetuses, and therefore the parents should be counseled that their risk of trisomy 21 is about 30%. Here's the typical sonographic appearance of duodenal atresia. In the upper abdomen, you have two fluid-filled structures dilated as we see here. These represent the dilated stomach and the dilated duodenal bulb. If you scan down a little bit inferiorly to this classic view, you will be able to see the connection between the stomach 
and the duodenum through the dilated pylorus. Bowel obstruction distal to the duodenum can occur at the jejunum, the ileum, or even the colon, and may result from a vascular accident, from a volvulus, or be the result of meconium plug or an intussusception. On ultrasound, we'll see dilated loops of bowel. The more distal the obstruction is, the more loops of dilated bowel we will see. We also may have polyhydramnios. So here's a fetus with jejunal atresia. The jejunum, jejunum is high, and therefore we only see one large loop of dilated bowel that's dilated because of the atresia below this point. In this case, there was mild polyhydramnios. This fetus has a distal bowel obstruction at the level of the ileum, and that's why we see multiple dilated loops of bowel. Notice that when the loops of bowel are dilated with fluid, that there's rapid peristalsis throughout, and this is typical of a bowel obstruction. Meconium peritonitis is something that happens after the bowel perforates inside the fetus. With the perforation, meconium spills into the peritoneal cavity and causes a chemical peritonitis. The first finding on ultrasound in these cases is ascites. Eventually, the ascites will be walled off into a cyst, and calcifications will collect in the wall of the cyst. In addition, wherever the the meconium has spilled into the peritoneal cavity, calcifications will be seen lining the peritoneal cavity, and eventually the cystic fluid will be resorbed. Here's a case we were able to follow through gestation. At 16 weeks, a diagnosis was made of free fluid in the fetal abdomen, with no other sign of hydrops. At 21 weeks gestation, we no longer had free fluid in the abdomen, but we now had a cystic structure in the upper abdomen, with calcification in the wall of that cyst. This represented a meconium cyst with the meconium calcifications. As time went on, the fluid in the cyst was resorbed and the fetus was left with calcification lining the peritoneal cavity. We can see it here on the undersurface of the liver and we can see it along the anterior surface of the abdominal wall within the peritoneum. A small bowel volvulus will result when the bowel is incompletely fixated to the posterior mesentery, and so it can rotate. And this rotation will lead to strangulation of the bowel and obstruction to the bowel proximal to that site. On ultrasound, we may have acute onset of polyhydramnios, which results at the time of the volvulus, and we will see dilated loops of small bowel proximal to the site of the twist. We may also see the, the loop that has twisted as a single larger dilated loop, and we may see the whirlpool sign of the twisted mesentery. Here's a fetus where we do see that whirlpool sign. On the still image, you see the dilated loop of the volvulus, and then if you watch on the clip, you can see the whirlpool of the curling around of the bowel and mesentery that led to the twisting of this loop. Here's another fetus with a volvulus. We see a very large dilated loop of bowel. This bowel was twisted, and it was twisted so tightly that it lost its blood supply, and so this loop was dead by the time the baby was born. Notice on the clip we do see dilated loops of bowel, and these were proximal to the site of the obstruction. Now we also look at the anterior abdominal wall. The only thing that should cross the anterior abdominal wall is the umbilical cord. Nothing else should be protruding from the anterior abdominal wall in a normal fetus. So we look at this in order to exclude an omphalocele, a gastroschisis, or disruption by the amniotic band syndrome. So in a normal fetus, when we look at a transverse view of the abdomen, the only thing protruding from the anterior abdominal wall should be the umbilical cord. A nymphalocele is an abnormal protrusion from the anterior abdominal wall. This defect is at the ventral wall at the site of the umbilicus, and through the defect, abdominal contents herniate in into a sac that's covered by a peritoneal membrane. Omphaloceles are commonly associated with other anomalies, so look at the fetus carefully and also the counsel, counsel the patients about the increased risk of aneuploidy. So here is a fetus with an omphalocele. On a longitudinal view of the fetus, we see protruding from the anterior abdominal wall 
a well-defined smooth mass that represents the emphalocele sac. On transverse view, we can see that the spine is posteriorly located. We have the stomach pulled anteriorly, and intra-abdominal contents are herniated anterior into the emphalocele sac. Running through the sac is the umbilical cord, which traverses it and then exits from the other side of the emphalocele. We can also look at this with 3D ultrasound. Here are two 3D ultrasounds from a fetus with an emphalocele showing the bulging sac from the fetus. And what's characteristic of an emphalocele on 3D is that the outer surface of the emphalocele is nice and smooth because remember it's covered by a peritoneal membrane. Here's another fetus with an emphalocele. The emphalocele sac is bigger than the fetal abdomen. Here's the fetal abdomen, the spine posteriorly, the stomach here in the left upper quadrant, and then protruding from it is a large emphalocele sac, also having some fluid in it as well as intra-abdominal contents. And here's the 3D of that fetus showing that very large but smooth-walled emphalocele. A gastroschisis is another abdominal wall defect that's different from an emphalocele. It's next to the umbilicus, not at the umbilicus. It's more common on the right than the left. And this defect allows abdominal contents to herniate into the amniotic cavity. The abdominal contents are not contained by a peritoneal membrane, and therefore the contour is not smooth like an emphalocele. Also, with a gastroschisis, other anomalies are uncommon. Gastroschisis are more common in young mothers, typically in their early 20s or even their teens. Usually the chromosomes are normal. About 40% will develop bowel dilatation prenatally, and about 80% will have postnatal complications related to the gastroschisis. These include infections or gastrointestinal complications such as persistent vomiting, reflux, constipation, or fistulas. So here's a 17-week fetus with a gastroschisis. You can see the umbilical cord insertion is normal, and adjacent to the cord insertion is a defect in the abdominal wall through which abdominal contents have herniated into the amniotic cavity. Notice that the contour of these abdominal contents is very irregular because, again, this is not contained by a peritoneal membrane. Here's another one, again showing an irregularly contoured mass protruding from the anterior abdominal wall. The umbilical cord insertion is normal and adjacent to this abdominal wall defect. And on the 3D, we see how irregular the contour of this gastroschisis is, making it easy to distinguish from an emphalocele. Here's an interesting case. At 22 weeks gestation, we saw a little bump protruding from the anterior wall of the fetus. We had no idea what this was. Even at 26 weeks gestation, it looked just like a, a little bit, a little tube protruding from the anterior abdominal wall. This is the penis of this male fetus. This is the umbilical cord. And then suddenly at 36 weeks gestation, all of this bowel, protruded from the anterior abdominal wall. So this was a gastroschisis with a defect in the anterior abdominal wall, but the abdominal contents did not protrude until 36 weeks gestation. Well, I'll now move on to the genitourinary tract. If you look at the images that we routinely take when evaluating the fetal, fetus, we take images of the kidneys and the bladder. We do not routinely look at the ureters or the genitalia, but there are certain situations where it is important to evaluate these structures. We look for the kidneys first to make sure that they're present to exclude renal agenesis, then to look at their location to make sure it's not ectopic. We move on then to the size and echogenicity of the kidneys to rule out things such as dysplasia or autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. And lastly, we look at the collecting system to exclude hydronephrosis. These are transverse and sagittal views of the fetus. We can see on a view from the, that looks at the posterior back of the fetus, we see the spine here with shadowing, and we see a kidney on either side of the spine in the renal fossa. The kidney is more hypoechoic than the bowel and liver in front of it, and it has a bright echogenic capsule and central echoes in the renal sinus. On longitudinal view, the kidney has a reniform shape, and by the third trimester, as this fetus is, we can see the hypoechoic pyramids separated by the more echogenic renal cortex.
We talked about amniotic fluid and how important swallowing is. Amniotic fluid is also, its genital urinary function is also important for amniotic fluid. When renal function is absent, then urine is not produced into the amniotic cavity and the fetus begins to be surrounded by severe oligohydramnios. With severe and prolonged oligohydramnios, changes will occur in the fetus, including pulmonary hypoplasia, abnormal fetal facies, and limb positional abnormalities. With bilateral renal agenesis, the fetus will be surrounded by severe oligohydramnios, and on ultrasound, we won't be able to identify any kidneys or a bladder. To help us make this diagnosis, we will note that the adrenal glands are oriented longitudinally, parallel to the spine, because they're not propped up by the kidneys. Now, bilateral renal agenesis does cause severe oligohydramnios and pulmonary hypoplasia, so this anomaly is incompatible with life. Here's a case of a fetus with bilateral renal agenesis. You can see that in this lower picture, we have a view of the abdominal aorta, and we see no vessels on either side, no evidence of renal arteries. On a transverse view of the abdomen, we see severe oligohydramnios, and we see the adrenal gland in the renal fossa, but no kidney. In a longitudinal view, we see that that adrenal gland, as is the other one, they're both oriented parallel to the spine. When there's unilateral renal agenesis, renal function can be normal. The contralateral kidney or the normal kidney will be compensatorily enlarged and have normal renal function. The affected side will have an empty renal fossa and the adrenal gland will be oriented longitudinally. You can see this on this diagram. We have the normal kidney with the normal adrenal gland on that side capping it. And on the contralateral side, the adrenal is lower than it should be and oriented parallel with the vessels and the spine. So on ultrasound, what we'll see is when we look at the posterior aspect of the fetus, we see the normal kidney in its proper location and no kidney in the contralateral renal fossa. A measurement of this kidney reveals that it's longer than normal at almost 5.1 centimeters, which is even longer than a fetus or than a neonate's kidneys typically is, and that's because this is compensatorily enlarged. When we look at the aorta, we see that there's only one renal artery coming from the aorta, and when we look at the renal fossa on that side, we see a lying down adrenal gland. Renal ectopia is when the kidney is in a place other than the renal fossa. The most common location is when the kidney is in the pelvis, but the kidney can also be crossed and fused to the contralateral kidney, where it's called cross-fused ectopia, or both kidneys may be fused across the lower pole, making a horseshoe kidney. With the pelvic kidney, we'll have an empty renal fossa, just like with unilateral renal agenesis. The adrenal gland will be located, will be oriented longitudinally, but when we look down in the pelvis, we'll see another kidney. Also, the contralateral kidney will be normally enlarged, normal size, not compensatorily enlarged. So here's a fetus who had a pelvic kidney. When we look at the fetus at the renal fossa, we see one kidney on one side and no kidney on the other. In that contralateral renal fossa, instead we see a lying down adrenal gland. And then when we look carefully, we were able to see that right kidney and then next to it down in the pelvis, the pelvic left kidney. When we have cross-fused ectopia, again, we have an empty renal fossa on the contralateral side, so the adrenal gland will be oriented longitudinally. The kidney will have an unusual shape. It may have an L-shaped and be very elongated because the contralateral kidney has fused with the lower pole on that side. So here's such a case. When we looked on the right renal fossa, all we saw was a longitudinally oriented adrenal gland, so we knew the kidney wasn't there. And when we moved over to the left side, we saw a large L-shaped kidney. Here's the left kidney. It seems to turn a corner as we get towards the midline because the right kidney has fused with the lower pole of the left kidney. Here we see views of the renal arteries in this case. You can see the, renal, the aorta is here. We have no renal artery on the right side, but we have the renal artery here extending to the left side. And here's a clip showing you the full extent 
of that uh, cross-fused ectopic kidney. Now with a horseshoe kidney, the kidneys are fused at their lower pole and both kidneys are lower in the abdomen than usual. So these are what is called totic kidneys. We'll see these as U-shaped kidneys when we scan with ultrasound. So we'll see renal tissue crossing in front of the abdominal aortic and inferior vena cava. So here is the case. You can see when we look at the aorta, we see the normal renal arteries. So we know there are two kidneys. But when we look at the kidneys more carefully, we see they have a horseshoe shape. And here you can see that horseshoe shape to these two kidneys because they're fused across the lower pole. On transverse view, we see renal parenchymal tissue crossing in front of the aorta and the inferior vena cava at the site of fusion. We assess the renal pelvis and calyces for dilatation in utero to diagnose hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis is diagnosed whenever there are dilated calyces or when the renal pelvis measures 7 millimeters or more from 16 to 20 weeks or 10 millimeters or more after 20 weeks. But sometimes we see a little bit of fluid in the renal fossa and some of those some of those fetuses prove to be abnormal. And so we classify those as possible hydronephrosis. So the follow-up scans are done. In these cases, you'll see a dilated renal pelvis that measures four to six millimeters from 16 to 20 weeks, or five to nine millimeters after 20 weeks gestation. So here's an 18-week fetus where we see that the renal pelvis measures six millimeters, and this we would classify as possible hydronephrosis. But this fetus, has calyceal dilatation throughout the kidney, and so this we would classify as definite hydronephrosis. Now hydronephrosis, when first diagnosed in gestation, may change during the course of gestation. It may resolve, it may be, remain unchanged, but it may progress. And so follow-up is important because at the first time of diagnosis, we are uncertain as to what the progression might be. Here, for example, is a fetus at 18 weeks gestation. The renal pelvis is on each side measured just under five millimeters. This is the level that we would just mention in our report as possible hydronephrosis. And here we can see the bladder, normal amniotic fluid, and the stomach. But when this fetus came back at 24 weeks gestation, we now have severe hydronephrosis. The renal cortex is somewhat echogenic, suggesting the development of dysplasia. And the urinary bladder is dilated with dilatation of the posterior urethra this was a case of posterior urethral valves. We did a study at our institution in conjunction with Boston Children's Hospital to look at the outcome of fetuses with prenatally diagnosed hydronephrosis. We had almost a thousand fetuses with dilated renal pelvis, some of which had calyectasis and some of whom did not. And we classified the hydronephrosis as mild, moderate, or severe based on the degree of dilatation of the renal pelvis. So here you can see when it was before 27 weeks, we called it mild if it was 4 to 7, moderate 8 to 10, and severe greater than 10. And then from 28 weeks to term, we called it mild at 5 to 9, moderate at 10 to 15, and severe at greater than 15. And we looked at the outcome of these fetuses. And our main goal in looking at outcome was to see how many fetuses actually required surgery because of their renal anomaly. When the diagnosis was mild in utero, fewer than 10% of fetuses actually required surgery for an abnormality. When it was mild with calyectasis, 14% did require it. And when it was moderate, 21% required surgery. And it was the cases of severe hydronephrosis where surgery was required in almost two-thirds of cases. The most common reason or cause of the obstruction that required surgery is the most common was a ureteropelvic junction obstruction followed closely by vesicoureteral reflux. And then a few other unusual anomalies accounted for surgery in the rest, posterior urethral valves, ureterovesical junction obstruction, ectopic ureteroceal, prune belly syndrome, neurogenic bladder, and cloacal anomaly. So you can see that ureteropelvic junction is the most common cause of neonatal hydronephrosis that um, would require surgery. It's also the most common cause of neonatal hydronephrosis. It's often a functional obstruction, so the renal cortex is preserved. 
about 30% of cases are bilateral, and it rarely develops into a dysplastic kidney. So here's a case of ureteropelvic pelvic junction obstruction. On a transverse view of the kidneys, we see unilateral dilatation of the renal pelvis to 13 millimeters. The coronal view of the kidney shows that not only is the pelvis dilated, but we have dilated calyces throughout the kidney. This is a fetus at 19 weeks gestation who had minimal dilatation of the renal pelvis to just under 5 millimeters. So in this case, we said possible hydronephrosis, not knowing if this would go away or progress. But you can see by 32 weeks gestation, the fetus now had obvious ureteropelvic junction obstruction. The renal pelvis measured almost 14 millimeters, and we see intrarenal calyceal dilatation due to the obstruction at the ureteropelvic junction. Vesico ureteral reflux results from an abnormal insertion of the ureter into the bladder. The ultrasound findings are classic with a hydronephrosis and hydroureter, but the ultrasound findings are identical for another pathologic process identified in, ureter, in utero, namely primary megaureter. This is when you have an aperistaltic segment of the distal ureter, and thus you have dilated, the dilated kidney and ureter, just like with vesico ureteral reflux. So the best we can do in utero is to diagnose hydronephrosis and hydroureter, and whether it's primary megaureter or vesico ureteral reflux will have to be determined after birth. So here's a fetus with hydronephrosis and hydroureter at 17 weeks gestation. On a transverse view of the kidney, we see the renal pelvis is dilated to almost 7 millimeters. And on a longitudinal view, we see intrarenal dilatation and dilatation of the ureter from the kidney down towards the bladder. This fetus has a similar diagnosis at 25 weeks gestation. The renal pelvis is dilated to 14 millimeters. In the clip, you can see that there's intrarenal dilatation, but in addition, there's a markedly dilated tortuous ureter extending from the kidney to the bladder. Renal duplication can occur in these cases. There may be two ureters arising from the kidney instead of one, and it is common in such situations for the upper pole ureter to become dilated and obstructed, as we see in this example. So in those cases, what we'll see is we'll see fluid in the kidney that will be, that we'll see more fluid in the upper pole than the lower pole because the distal ureter is dilated. And sometimes that distal ureter from the upper pole connects into a ureteroseal. So here's an 18-week gestation where we see in looking at the kidney that the upper pole is more dilated than the lower pole. When we look in the mid-abdomen, we see a dilated tortuous ureter, and when we look at the level of the bladder, we see two cystic structures because one represents the ureter seal and the other the urinary bladder. Renal dysplasia occurs from obstruction of drainage from the kidneys, and it presents in two forms. The dysplastic kidney may be thin and echogenic with minimal parenchyma, and it may have the appearance of hydronephrosis. And this type of dysplasia typically results from obstruction that occurs after 10 weeks gestation or from incomplete obstruction. The other form of renal dysplasia is a multicystic dysplastic kidney. This results from early complete obstruction of the kidney. The sonographic appearance is very different. With renal dysplasia from late obstruction, the kidney shows dilated calyces, hydronephrosis, and a very thin cortical mantle, as we see here. And the renal cortex that it does remain, or the renal parenchyma, is very echogenic. So here we have a fetus with posterior urethral valves, bilateral hydronephrosis, you can see it on the still image as well as the clip, and then mark thinning of the renal cortex here and here with increased echogenicity, all of this due to dysplasia. On the other hand, a multicystic dysplastic kidney presents as a kidney completely replaced by a large multicystic mass. These are typically unilateral, which is a good thing because when it is bilateral, it's incompatible with life. And this is the typical appearance of a multicystic dysplastic kidney. In the renal fossa, we'll see a collection of cysts with a little if any solid component. So here on transverse view is that collection of cysts. In the other renal fossa, we have a normal kidney. 
On sagittal view, we see a collection of cysts, and typically the size of the multicystic dysplastic kidney is much bigger than a normal kidney. Note that the amniotic fluid around this fetus is normal, and that's because the contralateral kidney is normal and replenishing the amniotic fluid with urination. Autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease is a disease of the kidneys that leads to renal failure and hepatic fibrosis. Overall, the prognosis is quite poor, but the severity does, the prognosis does depend a little bit on the severity of renal involvement at birth. On ultrasound, with this type of anomaly, we have enlarged echogenic kidneys, oligohydramnios, and absence of the bladder in those cases where the renal function is completely impaired. So here's a 33-week gestation. Notice that there's no amniotic fluid around this fetus. On a longitudinal view, notice that the kidneys are enormous. They measure more than eight centimeters on each side. While they retain their reno, reniform shape, they do have increased echogenicity. Notice that not only are they enlarged from top to bottom, but side to side as well. On this transverse view of the abdomen, we see that the kidney fills the abdomen anterior to posterior as well. This fetus also has autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, but in this case, we actually could see the microcysts inside the kidneys. We see all these very small cysts filling the renal parenchyma. We also see very large kidneys. This fetus also had an hepatic cyst, a finding that's associated with this type of disease. Now we also look at the urinary bladder first to see if the bladder is present, because if it is present, that does indicate that there is some renal function. An absence of the bladder would indicate absent renal function, which can be seen with bilateral renal agenesis or bilateral multicystic dysplastic kidneys or autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. Now the bladder may also be, may not have fluid in it when there's extrophy and the bladder is everted. When we see the bladder, we assess its size to look at, to see if it's enlarged, such as with posterior urethral valves. Normally, we should see the bladder in the pelvis or lower abdomen by the end of the first trimester as a fluid-filled anechoic structure, as we see here, and it's labeled by the arrow. With posterior urethral valves, the bladder is markedly enlarged. There will be hydronephrosis and hydroureter, and we may have severe oligohydramnios. This anomaly results from obstruction in the in the urethra at the level of the posterior urethra, and it's the second most common cause of hydronephrosis in the neonate. This anomaly only affects male fetuses. The characteristic appearance of posterior urethral valves is a dilated bladder and dilated posterior urethra that's sometimes been called the keyhole appearance. You can see in this case of posterior urethral valves, we have the dilated bladder, and then we have a, po a protrusion of fluid into the upper urethra and that represents the dilated posterior urethra. In this case, we can also see the very dysplastic small echogenic kidney associated with this abnormality. This fetus also has posterior urethral valves. It has the classic findings of severe oligohydramnios, a dilated bladder, a dilated posterior urethra, and dysplastic kidneys with hydronephrosis. You can see the hydronephrosis here and the echogenic cortex around the outside. Prune belly syndrome has similar ultrasound findings except that the amniotic fluid will be normal. This syndrome occurs because of abnormal or absent development of the abdominal musculature and abnormal smooth muscle. We'll have dilated bladder, dilated kidneys, and dilated ureters, and we may see the dilated urethra that will mimic a posterior that the upper urethra will mimic posterior urethral valves, but you may also see a dilated penile urethra. Because these fetuses still can produce urine, they can replenish the amniotic fluid, and so the amniotic fluid volume may be normal. And the development of urinocytes, which may occur with posterior urethral valves, does not occur with prune belly. So here's a fetus with prune belly syndrome. Notice that there is amniotic fluid around this fetus but we can see a dilated bladder. We can see that in addition, the kidneys are dilated, but the renal cortex is still has some thickness to it because it's not dysplastic. 
This is the penis. We can see fluid in the penile urethra, another classic finding with prune belly syndrome. Now bladder extrophy is when there's a defect in the anterior abdominal wall at the level of the bladder and the bladder is exposed to the outside of the fetus. It may even be everted, that is turned inside out and pushed outside of the fetal abdomen. Extrophy is associated with genital abnormality, so this is a time we would look at the genital tract as well. On ultrasound with extrophy, we'll have non-visualization of the bladder if the bladder is exteriorized, but we'll have normal amniotic fluid volume and normal kidneys. So that's how you know that the bladder is still able to transport urine out to the amniotic fluid. We may see a lower abdominal mass if the bladder protrudes from the anterior abdominal wall. And so here is such a case. Here is a view, a sagittal view of the fetus where we see a normal umbilical cord insertion and then just beneath it, we see a small mass protruding from the anterior abdominal wall. This fetus had normal appearing kidneys, but no bladder could be found in the pelvis. Here is another case. We see protrusion from the anterior abdominal wall below the cord insertion, and here's the baby at birth with the everted bladder and the bifid scrotum. Well, I did mention that sometimes it's important to look at the genitalia, particularly with things such as when you have bladder extrophy. And that's because we would want to diagnose ambiguous genitalia. If it is diagnosed, we then want to find out what's the karyotype, because depending on the karyotype will help figure out what the prognosis is for the fetus. So ambiguous genitalia is associated with a variety of syndromes as well as bladder extrophy. So here is a fetus who proved to have a male karyotype who had ambiguous genitalia. You can see that there is some form of a phallus protruding between two soft tissue structures. And so this could either be an enlarged clitoris or uh, that's located between the labia or a small phallus that's located between a bifid scrotum where the testicles are not descended. This proved to be a male fetus. Here's another one at 23 weeks gestation that we've evaluated with 3D ultrasound. You can see that the phallus is pointing downward, that the scrotum is bifid and splayed to either side. And here is another fetus, male fetus with ambiguous genitalia. Again, you can see the phallus located between the, the two sides of the scrotum rather than superior to it. Here you can see it in the same kind of view with the phallus here and the two parts of the scrotum. And by 33 weeks gestation now, the testicles had descended and we have a bifid scrotum with the two sides separated, not fused together. Well, I hope I've given you a good run through the gastrointestinal tract and genital urinary tracts, and I hope you find this useful in your practice. Thank you.